This is the Competitive Edge with Vanessa Van Edwards. Welcome to the Competitive Edge. My name is Scott Britton, and I'm here to help you answer a question that we all have. How can I get an edge in my business and life? Each week, we're going to uncover how some of the most successful and inspiring entrepreneurs, entertainers, and thought leaders get an edge so you too can reach your full potential. Do you want more unique ideas and tactics like the ones we're about to share in this episode? Then you're going to want to do two things. The first is to subscribe to the Competitive Edge on iTunes so that you don't miss out on new ideas from future conversations. After this, you're going to want to go check out my main site, lifelonglearner.com. When you enter in your email address to join the Lifelong Learner community, you'll get access to my most advanced strategies to stack the deck in your favor. Again, that's life-longlearner.com. Hey, what's going on, Competitive Edge listeners? Today is an absolutely fascinating episode and one that I think has the ability to change the way you interact with people, ipso facto, the quality of your life experience. Our guest today is Vanessa Van Edwards, founder of The Science of People. What the heck is The Science of People? Well, you'll find out in a minute when we hear from Vanessa, but I know some people hear the word science and immediately think, oh, this is going to be boring. Well, I can assure you today's episode is far from boring. A blaring majority of how people perceive us is tied to our nonverbal communication, yet so few people are even aware of what they're subconsciously signaling to everyone they meet. In today's episode, we dissect all types of nonverbal communication truths and tools so that you can not only make better impressions on everyone you meet, but also detect what emotions the people you're talking to are actually feeling. And yes, we are going to talk about lie detection. Studies have shown people who understand this nonverbal communication stuff not only have better relationships with their loved ones, but also earn 15 to 22% more money. If this is an incentive to tune in and find out what this stuff is all about, I don't know what will be. All righty, well, let's get on with the show and hear from Vanessa Van Edwards from The Science of People. Vanessa, how are we doing? I'm good. Happy to be here. I'm excited to have you here. And I think your company name is probably one of the coolest I've ever heard. Can you tell everyone, <laughs> can you tell everybody exactly what the science of people is? Yeah. So I'm glad you like it. Um, I'm a nerd. And so Me I too. honor science wherever I can. Um, and I love people as well. So when I was trying to think of a, a company, I was like, okay, we're taking the latest science out of academic institutions and peer reviewed journals. And I'm making it sexy and interesting and all about relatable to people. And I'm like science of people. So this is exactly what we do. I run a human behavior research lab in Portland. And my favorite thing to do is to do weird things and see how people react. And so, so is, you're it's just constant social experiments is what it sounds like constant. Like for example, um, this weekend, I will be going out as a blonde. I'm a brunette, and uh, I'm going out as a, yeah, I'm going out as a blonde and then a redhead. I'm going to be um, cataloging different uh, eye patterns um, and basically how people approach and treat me. Different vocal patterns, different verbal patterns. I'll be wearing a sociometer, which is basically measures sort of social interactions. Um, I did a. I always do like little previews of experiments to see if there's anything there and. So I wore a blonde wig out um, just to see what would happen. And I noticed that people's eye patterns were completely different when I was a blonde versus a brunette. So I thought I would um, make it a little bit more official. <laughs> Can I ask you, did you have more fun as a blonde? Oh, that should be the name of my study. Um, <laughs> I did not have more fun as a blonde, but it was awesome. Well, that's good to hear. I'm glad you had a good time. So, you know, I, I, I'm so fascinated by all of these things. And I thought what we could really talk about today is, is just the nonverbal stuff, is the body language. Because so many times in what I do and in my life, which is sales, marketing, people are always like, tell me what to say. What's the script? How do I, what is the first thing I say? And, you know, how much of that is really important and how much of it's really more about how our face looks, how our body looks? So it's, it's really interesting because most people who are in sales, marketing, persuasion, they think about the technical skills, they think about their script, 
but that is only 40% of how we communicate or how we send a message to another person. 60% is nonverbal, our voice tone, what we wear, our facial expressions, our body language. And that is at a, at a minimum. The lowest studies we could possibly find found that 60% of our communication is nonverbal. It goes up to 93%, that 93% of our communication is nonverbal. And if you're romantic with someone, if you're making out or doing other physical things, it's 100% nonverbal because hopefully you're not talking to someone as you're making out with them. So a lot more nonverbal at play than what we realize. And just out of curiosity, just so we can like properly package this, is voice tonality and all of that, does that fall within the body language and nonverbal or is that more, I guess, within that 7 to 6, 40% range? Yes. Yeah, so good question. So um, when I say nonverbal, I mean body language, voice tone, and facial expressions. When I say body language, I'm really just talking about body behavior. So um, when 60% of communication is nonverbal, that includes body language, voice, and facial expressions. Got it. And, and, and I'm such a buyer in these, um, I guess, these numbers that you're revealing because I know in my, in my interactions with people, whether I'm in the office, whether I'm out at a bar with friends, whatever it is, like how I say things and just the energy and presence that I have completely changes the receptivity of the other person that I'm trying to communicate with. C completely. And, and, th and studies have shown that our emotions are contagious. So if you show up with all the perfect things to say, but you don't feel it, you don't express it, you don't show it, then people pick up on the genuine emotion that's there. So for example, if you show up and you say, I'm so happy to be here, right? That, that I said the words, I'm so happy to be here, but my God, I sound like I'm dying inside, you know? So, but if I come in, I'm like, I'm so happy to be here. You can't even see my body, but you can see the energy there is totally different. And that emotion is contagious. I can hear your smile almost. I'm smiling. I'm smiling, Scott. You can't see it, but I am. I I believe you. So my, my next, and, and I'm curious, are these, are these like all tied together? Like, does the tonality of my voice change the way that my face looks, which then changes the way that I say the words? Yes, it is a big feedback loop. So what you want to think of when, when you're looking at body language is that your body shapes your mind and your mind shapes your body. So what they found is something we'll talk about facial expression specifically is called the facial feedback hypothesis. And what that is, is that not only does your emotion cause your face, so you feel happy and you make a happy smile, but also if you start with a smile, you will begin to feel happy. So it's a very interesting feedback loop that um, builds on itself. So if we're in a bad mood and we want to change our state, the first thing we can do is just start smiling. Yes, you can start smiling as long as it's a genuine smile. And, and remember, that's only one aspect of happiness. Happiness also comes from pride. It also comes from confidence. It comes from success. So yeah, one way, one of the things I teach in my courses is, is a success routine. A genuine smile is one aspect, one of five different things on a success routine. Another one could be going and reviewing your success file. So a uh, folder of emails from friends and family or fans or readers or customers raving about you and your service. That would make you feel proud. That would remind you of your successes. So there's a couple different things you can do. But that is one of them, definitely. You know, I know we didn't plan on talking about this, but a success ritual, I mean, you can't drop that one and have me not want to dig into it. I call that a talking bomb. Oh, right? you, you just dropped one. And <laughs> let's just go ahead because I mean, daily rituals, man, there's nothing more powerful just to anchor ourselves in empowering states. So to just kind of outline exactly what this is for people listening real quick, I think would be super helpful. Sure. So basically, um, I'm a big proponent of not faking it, right? So I don't want you to ever fake it until you make it. I actually don't like that idea. I think that that breeds inauthenticity. I think people can pick up on that. That's what fake interactions are. So I always say, if you're about to go on a date or you're going to go into a business meeting, you're going to go to a networking event, you have to feel proud and successful and not just fake being proud and successful. So before you go anywhere, you have to prep to get yourself into that mindset. And so there's a couple different things you can do depending on what kind of learner you are, right? If you're audio, visual, or kinesthetic. So uh, if you're visual, what works really well is um, I have a favorite YouTube channel and I have favorited all of the YouTube videos that either make me laugh are inspirational, uh, are motivational, intriguing, and I will play that channel as I'm getting ready. So that's a really great visual way that you can stimulate those intriguing, inspired 
uh, my, that, that mindset that's inspiring. Um, if you're an audio learner, you can have a playlist. So like the Rocky theme song, um, music that just gets you pumped up, whatever that is for you, a little bit of Gunther, you know, whatever, whatever floats your boat. Nice. Um, that's that, the audio side. And then kinesthetic can be calling a friend, right? We all have those friends that are really supportive. So calling a friend, ch- talking to them, they always snap you out of that bad mood. Um, it could be dancing, right? Um, a lot of people who just want to rock it out in their room. That's a great one. Um, and then also the smiling and or power posing. So smiling is a way to um, get your brain into that happy mindset using the facial feedback hypothesis. And power posing is when we take up space with our body. We claim territory. We spread our feet at least hip width or shoulder width apart. We um, put our hands on our hips and we stand like Superman or Wonder Woman. The studies have shown that that increases our testosterone levels, lowers our cortisol levels, and makes us feel like we are more successful. I dig it. I love it. And I'm, I'm actually kind of curious about that study in regards to testosterone because I am a dude and yes. <laughs> I know how critical that stuff is for all types of things that are interesting to me. That It's a 20% spike in testosterone, correct? When we do that power pose? Depending on the length and depending on the study. Yeah, around there. Okay. And how long does that last? So what it's like a feedback loop. So let's say that you stand in most of the studies, they power pose between two and five minutes. So what I'll do is like, I'll bring a newspaper before a business meeting and I'll stand in the waiting, waiting room and read it. That's a super easy way to stand in powerful body language. And it's very natural. So, um, two to five minutes to get, to get those juices flowing. And then as long as you stay in that powerful mindset, you don't go right back into shrinking behavior. You can keep those testosterone incredi- incre- testosterone level incredibly high for as long as you want. It's just a matter of uh, keeping that feedback loop going. And for guys, this is important because testosterone is a precursor, high testosterone is a precursor to things like confidence, energy, many things which make a positive first impression. And, and can I geek out on you for a second? Please geek out. Okay. So um, it's so important for men and women. And what they found is that testosterone is a critical component to alpha behavior. So an alpha is someone who is the leader in some in negative a negative way. It could be someone who is socially dominant, but typically you can make that a positive thing by being inspiring uh, the person who's in the most powerful uh, position in a group. And this can happen both socially and in business situations. Women are most attracted to men who are alphas, either social alphas or business alphas, and men are also attracted to women who are alphas because they are more self sufficient. They're better. They're more likely to raise children successfully. So. What they found was when they examined um, chimps, they in, in chimpanzee groups, the alpha is much more apparent than in, in, with humans. And they found that always across the board, no matter what, the alpha chimp has the most testosterone. But what's interesting about that, because it's not all that surprising, is that if the chimp is overthrown by someone else in the group, within two days, their testosterone levels go down to the average of the group. And the person who took over, their testosterone levels shoot up to the original alpha's level. So, so it's, all, some, it's, it's like self-fulfilling prophecy. Genetic, yeah, biogenetics. yeah, exactly. And you can change it. Like it's not that you have to be born with the highest levels of testosterone. You know, the, the chimp that was born with the highest levels of testosterone is not necessarily the alpha. It's the person who decides to step into that role. Right. And you know, I'm just so glad. I'm, I'm glad that we brought this up for a couple of reasons. Number one, when I say testosterone and I'm actually having a buddy I don't know if you know Chris Walker, founder of testosterone.io, um, come on the show to talk about this. When people hear that word, they just think of like aggressive, angry males getting in bar fights. <laughs> yeah. And it's just so, it's so unfortunate because it, 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 so many other parts that can possibly affect our lives are related to this hormone. And I'm glad that you brought up the part about women as well, because for me, like, heck yeah, like independent, self-sufficient woman is exactly what I like, and my friends like who are successful, confident guys. So, you know, I'm glad that this is not just something that only males should be focused on optimizing. Awesome. Yes. I, I'm excited that you're bringing someone on to talk about testosterone because it's, it's a, an area that I think we all need to, ch- testosterone has a bad rap. Let's change it. Absolutely. So let's kind of dive in a little bit. So, you know, I like, I like how we've kind of talked about building state and because a lot of people, they expect to like go into a conference or a meeting or maybe a first date and things, things just them just to be on instead of actually cultivating a ritual that puts them in that place where they're ultra confident, they're feeling good. They're displaying nonverbal cues of an alpha 
you might say. What particular things should we know about first impression science and how we can then use that information to make excellent first impressions? Yeah. So first impression science, I think, is a fascinating area that isn't talked about enough. And the reason for that is because we really underestimate the power of the first impression. Um, these are snap judgments. Um, thin slicing is another name for first impressions. A thin slice is a quick judgment or assessment you make of someone or someone makes of you. Um, one of my skills is speed reading people. So I can usually look at someone and speed read them very quickly to assess their trust, honesty levels, intelligence, and charisma. And that is based in science. So to remember the, the importance of nonverbal, you can think of the um, mnemonic device pain. So P is for permanent. And what they found was, is that David C. Funder did research on, on first impressions and found that when someone makes a first impression, it usually happens immediately in one-tenth of a second. One-tenth of a second. Wow. So most people are under the false impression. Their first impression happens the moment they open their mouth. So they think when they walk into a room and they approach someone, their first impression starts when they say, hello, my name is. Or if they're in a group, it only starts when they start talking or they respond to a question. That's actually not the case. Our first impression starts the moment we are seen, the first one-tenth of a second. So once it happens, it becomes permanent. People make a rule for you in their brain. When they observe people's brains, they found that they, the brain actually decides that that person is their initial first impression. And any subsequent interaction, even if it's totally different, like let's say that you meet someone on a really bad day and you go, man, this person is a downer, super negative, do not like them. And you meet them again and they're in a totally different mood that only becomes the corollary to the rule. So it becomes an exception. It doesn't change the rule. It's almost like, wow, so-and-so Debbie Downer was in a good mood today. Exactly. Instead of, instead of like, oh, they're really an awesome person. Exactly. And so permanent, accurate. So we also have found that when you look at the big five, so the big five are the big five different personality traits, um, we can judge someone's four of the five personality traits accurately in the first one-tenth of a second. So the only personality trait that we cannot do accurately is neuroticism. We have a very, very hard time judging. All those neurotic. closet neurotics like, yes. Yes, yes, she doesn't know how anxious I am that I'm secretly Woody Allen. No, uh, it's very hard for people to judge that right away. Everything else, though, we can get pretty accurate. So permanent, accurate, I is immediate, right? That one-tenth of a second. And the last one is nonverbal that most of our first impression happens based on nonverbal cues and nothing, it has nothing to do with what we say, because obviously how much can you say in one tenth of a second? Wow. Okay. So obviously there's a lot that comes into this. Is, is this something that, that can be taught? Can somebody be taught how to make incredible first impressions if they're not necessarily already walking, walking around the room, confidently taking up space, talking in a tonality that makes them alpha? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. It can be changed. It can be taught. People who are charismatic, memorable, magnetic, walk into a room and you're like, oh my God, I've got to meet that person, does not have to be an innate ability. It can be. There are people who were born that way, but a lot of the most memorable and charismatic people hone and craft that ability. Um, I am an incredible recovering awkward person. I used to be super, super awkward. I'm only now sort of awkward. So I've come a long way. Um, and so me of anyone knows that you can hone those skills. And I've worked with students in our courses and I've seen just amazing changes when people realize that they actually can change it, but they just have to know what to change, right? It's just about having a tool set that you can use in the right situations. I love it. And you know, the one thing that I always think about, think about with this is like, how important is congruence? Because Somebody can watch videos and be like, okay, cool. I'm going to like make my chest look a little bigger. I'm like, wave my arms. Um, I don't know why I'm talking in a Southern accent right now <laughs> when I started to do that. But I mean, does it start within? Do you really have to feel all of these alpha traits to ultimately be perceived as alpha in a first impression? So there's no science on that specific question. So I'm going to have to go into my personal experience. And I would say most, probably 80% or more, is, has to be congruent. But there are some things that you can do non-verbally that you can 
do to emphasize or increase things that you might not necessarily feel. So most of it has to be completely congruent with the way that you feel, but not everything. Got it. And, you know, I, I feel like you're teasing here. What are <laughs> just a few of those things uh, to think about? So some of the easy things that you can really change are, um, and I'll stick with nonverbal because I there's there's verbal things as well, of course. But uh, non-verbally, is it, it's incredibly important to be able to read someone's facial expression. Mm. And the reason for that is, is twofold. First, if you're reading someone's facial expression, you are showing an intense level of engagement. You are really listening to them. You're not doing what I call wishful hearing. Um, wishful hearing is like when you're listening to someone and you're just hearing what you think you're hearing or you think you want to hear. Um, you're not actually looking and listening to what's happening. So you're really engaged with them. You know, most of the time we just listen with our ears, but tuning into someone's facial expressions along with their words, people are blown away by the amount of attention that you're paying to them. And that makes you more memorable, which is a sort of funny thing. So what does that look like tactically? Does that mean looking at somebody in the eye immediately as you enter a conversation and holding it? Um, it doesn't necessarily mean holding it. So in an, in an average conversation, we make eye contact 60 to 70% of the time. So you actually don't want to go above 70% because uh, that makes you creepy, right? <laughs> freaks people out. Yeah, freaks people out. So um, the ideal is, is 60 to 70%, right? In that nice high average. Um, so that means that when they're speaking, you are paying attention to them. Um, in between, like, so the, the pause in between words, you might look to the side as you're gathering your own thoughts. And or when you are speaking, you make gestures, you can look off to the side, um, so it's still a natural eye pattern, but you are checking in with their face at regular intervals. Got it. You know, it's such an f interesting phenomenon that I realized probably about a year and a half ago and I started to be super cognizant and change is many people when they start speaking, all of a sudden look away and they only yeah. are kind of checking in on the person that they're speaking with when they're listening. Yes. Okay. So um, that's actually an alpha behavior. So alphas typically will um, pay attention when someone else is speaking. They'll give them that nonverbal respect of eye contact. But when they're speaking, they can look around as they're accessing and gathering their thoughts. For those people who do NLP, I do not do NLP, but there's a lot of um, talk at NLP about how you access different memories and imagination. So it's totally natural for someone else to look away while they're speaking. What you don't want is to be looking away while someone else is speaking, because that's a nonverbal sign of disrespect. Got it. Yeah, I, I, I personally feel like there is a balance there where you don't want to be like incredibly approval seeking and just like, hey, did you hear what I said? Did you hear what I said? Like, <laughs> yeah. you, are you listening to me? But at the same time, like holding that eye contact, look away, hold, look away, like constantly bouncing around is this, this is kind of a balance there because a lot of times when people are talking to me and they don't look at me, I'm like, dude, look me in the eye when you talk to me. Like, I can't, are you afraid to of what you're saying? Yeah, I guess, you know, now that you say that, the, the better, the simpler answer to that, to that question was what you want to do is you want to anchor at the face. So instead of looking down into your drink as your anchor or looking down at their feet or your feet as the anchor, that when you check back in with them, it, your eye pattern lands on their face. So I guess that's the way to do it is that it's an anchor. You don't necessarily have to hold it there, but that's where you keep checking back to. Everyone think, can think of a person where you're talking to them and they're looking down at their feet or their drink or their purse or their hand or the door, and that's their anchor point, it's very, very distracting. It's non-verbally disrespectful. So just making it their face, turning that into your anchor, is, makes it so that you're much more charismatic. Awesome, and I just encourage everybody out there listening, next time you're in an interaction with somebody, pay attention to where you look. Because a lot of people will listen to this, oh yeah, that makes sense, cool, and then they'll forget about it. So just be aware of that, I'd encourage you, and you know, it can be a good litmus test of how confident am I, and am I displaying that if I am very confident? Yeah, we are very unaware of um, how we come across nonverbally. Um, study after study has shown that we always rate ourselves as more engaging, more charismatic, um, and above average than we actually are. So when we film students, we'll oftentimes we'll work with students and we'll actually film them out at bars or in interactions. They are shocked to see how they look. Um, they are, they can't believe that they actually were tapping their foot the whole time. They can't believe that their hands were in their pockets. They don't even remember doing that. They can't believe that they access or they anchor at the door or someone else's hands. Um, so it's really important. Just, just being aware of it can dramatically change your patterns. 
Got it. Now, I know that you're an expert in what is commonly called micro expressions. And I think this is really interesting stuff because it's not only pervasive conversationally, but across our computer screens. Uh, so let's let's kind of dive into this a little bit. And maybe we could start with what actually am I talking about when I say micro expression? Yeah. So a micro expression is a very brief involuntary facial expression that we make when we feel an intense emotion. So that means that when we feel an intense emotion like anger or sadness, that shows up very briefly on our face without us being in control of it. So the way that it was discovered is Dr. Paul Ekman, who's a, an amazing nonverbal researcher, he discovered and coined the microexpression. He figured out that people across cultures, across races, across sexes, make the same facial expressions for different emotions, which is really surprising because it was once thought that babies were born, they looked at their mother or father's face, and they mimicked the face. And that's how we learned facial expressions. That was the belief for a long time. But what he figured out was actually babies are born with the ability, the innate ability to make certain facial expressions based on emotions. And he figured this out by looking at congenitally blind children. So children who have been blind since birth, they've never seen a face before. Within a month or even a few days of being born, they make the same facial expressions as seeing babies. So even though they've never mirrored a face, they've never mimicked a face, they still make the same sadness expression, the same fear expression, the same happiness expression as seeing babies, which shows us that somehow our facial expressions are coded within us. The reason why this is important and not just interesting and informative is because it's the basis of empathy. If we can read people's facial expressions without even paying attention to their words, we are able to spot hidden emotions. We can see how someone truly feels about us, or the people around us, and we can detect deception. So microexpressions is a huge, huge aspect of detection deception. So deception detection, I should say. So basically lies. Yeah, exactly. So um, one of the things that we teach in our courses is the seven steps of lie detection. And microexpressions features prominently because if someone says, I'm so happy to be here, but flashes an anger microexpression, you know that there's an, in, there's an incongruence there, right? Their words and their face do not match. So, I mean, fundamentally, the reason why people should care about microexpressions is you can immediately understand exactly what the person is thinking and feeling across from you and thus calibrate your communication in order to get somebody to take the action that you want them to take, whether that's buy something, go on another date with you, whatever it is. Exactly. Wow, that's so fascinating. So maybe we could just, real, I know we're doing an audio here, but maybe we could real quick just like dive into a few of the different micro expressions that are super easy to learn and popular so that people can kind of walk away from this conversation and start to pay attention to people's facial expressions and what that actually means. Yeah, so um, Dr. Ekman discovered that there were seven different facial expressions um, and he's obviously working on more, but the basic seven cover a lot of bases actually. Um, and what you can do is I, I have a, a link on my website that's, I have all the expre expressions demoed and videos for free. So you can practice them as much as you want. Um, it's scienceofpeople.com slash face if you want to follow along. So, um, the, my, I'll do my favorite micro expressions. So the easiest one to recognize and the one I think one of the most powerful ones is contempt. So contempt mm -hmm. is the expression for hatred or disdain and it's the simplest, but the most deadly in that it's just a one-sided mouth raise. So if you just list, lift one side of your mouth, either side, doesn't matter which, it looks like a little smirk. Yeah. That is the contempt micro expression. And that is what we make when we feel strong dislike towards someone or something that's being said. And the reason, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. This is really fascinating. So my question real quick before we kind of dive into some of the science behind this, do we intuitively are able to recognize this or is this something like, unless you didn't know that somebody was feeling contempt, like we would never know via this yeah. expression. We're not great at subconsciously honing in on our intuition with micro expressions. Um, the only ones that we're better at is um, fear is a pretty easy one for us to recognize because it's a survival mechanism. So if you're standing on a subway platform, and someone across the platform flashes a micro expression of fear, you immediately go into fight or flight response because if they're afraid, you might have to be afraid. And so instantly you turn around and start looking around at what's around you. 
So we are very attuned to fear. That's one that we intuitively pick up on quite quickly um, for survival needs. And the other one is um, happiness, genuine happiness. And the reason for this is because happiness is the only micro expression that we can spot from 300 feet away. And that is because survival mechanism, again, if you are a caveman and you're being approached by a stranger caveman um, and you don't know if he's going to attack you, steal your food or be a friend, if he smiles and has genuine smiling, then you know, ah, this is a friend, not a foe. So we can recognize that from very, very far away. We can also spot fake happiness very easily as well. When you see the absence of happiness, you know, ah, this person isn't truly happy for me. And that comes off as inauthenticity. If you've ever been called fake or inauthentic um, or not believable, it might be about fake happiness. So what is, what is fake happiness versus true happiness look like manifested on our face? So um, if you put your pen or pencil in, your, in between your teeth and uh, make a smile so that your lips do not touch any part of the pen or pencil, so pull them up as far away from the pen as you possibly can, that is the closest to real happiness you can get. And the reason for that is because it consciously activates those upper cheek muscles along the sides of your eyes. So the only true indicator of happiness is not a smile. It's the activation of those muscles. So it means your smile literally has to reach your eyes. Hmm. Wow. So I'm curious because I feel like I smile a lot and I'm not like, you know, doing the high cheekbone thing. Does that mean that I'm less happy or I'm just kind of like fake faking happy? It means, it means, um, it could mean content, right? You know, content is positive. It means you're happy, but it doesn't mean you're like in full blown happiness. So it's not necessarily fake. It just is a moderate happiness, if that makes sense. Got it. Let's go back to the contempt contempt micro expression and how we can diagnose that because I think it's super interesting. Yeah. So, um, the most powerful research around contempt comes out of Seattle. Dr. John Gottman is a marriage and family researcher. And, uh, 40 years ago, he decided he wanted to figure out why couples got divorced and, um, why couples got divorced and how you could predict a divorce which is a huge, huge topic. That's insane. Yeah, yeah. And he decided he has a, like a love lab up in Seattle where he couples come in and he tests them and he researches all aspects of relationships. Fascinating guy. I've attended a couple of his workshops and seminars and he's just amazing. And so this study was his really groundbreaking work that he did. So what he did was he decided to study different couples and he brought a couple hundred couple, couples into the lab and he tested everything he could possibly think of everything from hair samples to blood samples to urine samples. He interviewed their kids, their parents, their friends, their siblings. He videotaped them in their home. He asked about chores. He looked at backgrounds. He looked at their jobs, their income levels. He looked at how they spoke to each other, the words they used. He did interview after interview after interview, asking them about, it's called an oral history interview, where he asked them every aspect of their life and all their values. And then he followed all of those couples for 30 years. Jeez, that's, talk about a patient guy. <laughs> right, right. He knew he was onto something big. So at the end of the 30 years, there was a huge percentage of those couples had gotten divorced. And he wanted to know, was there anything from all those tests that could predict which of the couples were going to get divorced and which of them weren't? And what he found was with 93.6% accuracy, which in science is insane that, that he get a number like that. Any couple who showed contempt in their initial intake interview was going to get divorced within 30 years. Wow. And he could do that with 93.6% accuracy. He can now today watch a silent video of a couple and tell you with that accuracy, if they're going to get divorced, just based on looking for that micro expression. Because if you're in a couple and someone feels hatred or disdain towards the other, it means that you're never going to get that respect back. Anger can be overcome, right? Distrust can even be earned back. Trust can be earned back. But once you get to hatred, once you get to contempt, it's very, very hard to recover from it. So when you are on a date or in a business meeting or working with a client and you see contempt aimed at you, so not necessarily contempt aimed at an issue or someone else, but aimed at you, I would say tread very, very carefully. And again, that is just that kind of like upper raised mouth gesture on one side. Yeah, one side. It looks like a smirk, 
that one-sided mouth smile. Wow. That's so interesting. I can just like imagine people just running to their partner right now to have a conversation with them and see if they can detect this. And, and please look at all of your social media profile pictures, look at your headshot, make sure you're not making that expression online. Because if you do that, you're unconsciously saying to people, I don't really want to be friends with you. I don't really like myself. I don't really like doing this, right? It's a very negative way of being. So please go check. <laughs> you know, what's funny. I'm like kind of freaking out right now because my, my, uh, app, your Skype, I, your no, Skype no, my picture? iTunes, my iTunes picture has oh, been, no. people are like, yeah, you got this like confident smirk on your face. And I, you know, I took the picture of my living room. I wasn't even trying to do that. Um, but uh, now I'm like looking at it and <laughs> hopefully people <laughs> you might have to on me. change that. Hopefully you change it. <laughs> I know. So, you know, it's actually funny. I, you know, I was listening to another interview and I've heard you talk about how you can actually determine how successful somebody is based upon the pictures of themselves online. And I think that is incredibly facet, fascinating, especially when so many, so much of our lives are just like in the judges that people are making us around like social media initially, at least. Yeah. So one of the um, citizen science projects we're doing in our lab. So in our lab, we look at science and then try to test it in real life is this idea that the face holds the key to success and that we judge someone just based on their face. Um, this is based on a study by Nalini Ambadi, where she looked at pictures of the top 25 CEOs and pictures of the bottom 25 CEOs from the Fortune 500 list. And she picked out all the unrecognizable ones and she showed them to participants in her, in her um, she works at Tufts University, and she had them rate those pictures on leadership characteristics, power, charisma, intelligence, influence. What was amazing is that Students, without knowing the rankings of these pictures, rated the pictures with the highest leadership skills were also the people who ranked at the top of the Fortune 500 list. So that means that there is a leadership look mm. that people can look powerful, which makes us treat them more powerful, which then makes them more successful. So the study, what the study didn't do was talk about the patterns in those faces, right? Like, what was it about those faces that made them successful? So what we're doing in the lab, and we're actually not done with the experiment yet, is we are trying to figure out what those patterns are. So we have replicated the study with Twitter pictures. And what we're doing, and I would love if you want to come play in our labs, they're all online, you can just click around, um, is that we are asking people to look at pictures of people on Twitter and pick who they think has the most followers to see if people can accurately guess we found so far, we've had about 700 people take play in our labs and it, it is, it has been repeated. So people can accurately guess and they don't know exactly why, but they can figure out who has the most followers on Twitter just by looking at their profile picture. And it has nothing to do with good looks. That's what's interesting. It's not the most good looking person. We found a couple of patterns so far. I don't want to release them just yet because we haven't finished the study, but, um, there, when you're looking at your picture, I would highly recommend definitely making sure you have no contempt. If you're smiling, make sure it is a genuine smile. Um, and to make sure that you are taking that picture at a moment of true happiness. So as opposed to going to a photo shoot and like posing, you're much better off asking someone to snap a headshot of you when you're out with friends, you know, by yourself off, off to the side, not maybe not with all your friends or after a party or at your birthday when you already have those really good juices flowing, that seems to help a lot in the authenticity of the picture. All you online daters, I hope you're listening intently. <laughs> so, wow, I'm very curious. Like, is there anybody out there who has done just an excellent job of appearing powerful online? Oh, um, that's such a good question. I mean, because I feel like there's certain people out there. It's like, oh, yeah, Bill Clinton, the most charismatic guy ever. So and so incredibly charismatic. And I'm just curious, you know, are these people that quote unquote, so charismatic in person, such great leaders? Can we can we know that about them just by their pictures? So I actually have um, a, a video that I did. It's, it's for free on a website called um the uh, body language of experts. And I basically examine the body language of a couple different big, big boys and big girls out there like uh, Derek Halpern and Marie Forleo and Chris Gillibo and 
um, all those awesome people. And I basically talk about what they're doing right with their body language. So like, for example, Derek Halpern comes across as extremely charismatic because of his varied facial expressions. He has a very, very um, vivid and expressive face. And we like that. as people. We love to watch you with expressive faces, especially when they're authentic. And he's typically very passionate about what he talks about. And that passion comes across both verbally and physically. Um, Chris Gillibo is an example of someone who uses movement really well. Um, he wrote The $100 Startup. What he does is when he speaks on stage in his TED Talk, he really commands the stage. He uses movement to his, exam- to his, um, to his advantage. And our eyes like to follow objects in motion. So for him, that makes him very charismatic. We literally want to follow his every move. So if, if, if you're thinking about you know, being an expert or being a leader in your industry, if that's something you're interested in, I highly recommend you watch that video. I actually show a couple of examples. That sounds like a good one. We'll definitely link that up in the show notes. I, you know, I've often heard the phrase, um, smile with your eyes. What's, what's that all about? And is that true? Yeah, that's exactly true. That, that, what they mean, what they're trying to say is that they don't realize that that intuitive thing, they don't realize why someone is just smiling. They have a dead smile, right? It's just on the very bottom half of their face. Um, the smiling with your eyes is actually not your eyes proper. It's the muscles along the sides of your eyes, upper cheeks. It's kind of where you make those crow's feet wrinkles. If you like, if you smile really big, look for those wrinkles along the side of your face. Um, those are your crow's feet wrinkles. And, um, that's what they mean. It's that those muscles are activated. That's, that's the true indicator of happiness. Um, what's sad is that a lot of women these days are injecting Botox or getting plastic surgery to get rid of those lines. What they found was because of the facial feedback hypothesis that if you numb your wrinkles, you actually begin to feel the emotion less. So women who have numbed their happiness wrinkles also feel less happy. So note to self, if I want to be happy, never get Botox. <laughs> exactly. And if you, want a, if you want a happy partner, make sure that she keeps her wrinkles intact. Is there a difference between male and female when it comes to these micro expressions and what, and what we're trying to convey or not at all. Um, actually our facial expressions are completely universal. So both men and women make the exact same ones, which is very helpful. Yeah, that's, that's super helpful. And, you know, I think one of the big, the big things that you alluded to earlier that I know I'm dying to learn about, and I've heard a few things, but I'm just curious to get your take. How can we tell somebody's lying? Um, So that is a seven-step process. Lie detection is a very robust science. It's fascinating. It's both a blessing and a curse. So I I caution people who are listening, if you do want to dive deep into lie detection, to really make a decision, you know, really decide that you want to do it. Because once you see lies, you really can't go back. You know, I, I, I feel like when you know how to recognize facial expressions and spot hidden emotions, it's like interacting in high definition. You all of a sudden see things you never saw before. So um, lie detection takes seven steps. 